On August 5, 1976, the ABA officially ceased to exist, merging with its elder cousin, the NBA, and ushering in the modern era of professional basketball. The ABA had spent the last nine years treading water behind the draw of basketball's leading attraction, one Julius Irving. A fancier, ISO-focused, more careless style of offense was the ABA's calling card, but the inability to compete with the NBA for television time proved to be their downfall. Make no mistake, however, the NBA was far from the successful and prosperous enterprise it is today, needing the ABA much more than the stagnating elder statesman would have you believe. On August 6, 1976, the course of professional basketball would be forever changed, and after an excruciating wait, the world's biggest basketball star now finally found himself headlining its premier league. Welcome to the PurePoint Project. Today, we are getting into our newest project where we are going to be evaluating every NBA season with a little bit of a deep dive since the merger back in 1976. I'm Jeff Blagden. I'm Xavier Barnett. And, well, we thank you for joining us along as we uh, as we look into the 1976-77 NBA season, the first season in which the NBA and the ABA officially merged together and became one league of their own it's a very interesting uh, uh and eventful season to say the least yeah big uh, time season uh this is the season where obviously uh the aba joins the nba and uh mr irvin comes into the league julius Doc- irvin finally making his way over to uh to the place where he'll get more of that tv time i mean a, a lot it's funny how much of the 70s was just uh we look at we look at what Michael Jordan did for basketball in the 90s and what Larry Bird and what uh, Magic Johnson did in the 80s and we forget what Dr. J did for basketball in the 70s because the ABA if it didn't have Dr. J the ABA would have folded much sooner. I mean that last season of the ABA the 75-76 season had 9 teams at the start of the year. Two of those teams folded mid-year. <laughs> That's... Because they they just didn't have the money, they couldn't do it. <laughs> but on the back of Dr. J and the New York Nets actually making some money for the league, they were able to stay afloat at least for that year until the point where they could leverage themselves to the NBA for that merger. Mm-hmm. It's uh, yeah, it's it's really it really is impressive. I mean, the the guy had a whole league revolving around him, and then he comes to the NBA and immediately is in the finals that year yeah it's uh yeah just takes it takes philly all the way to the finals they win 50 games which is uh, not the most in the league in the league but uh tied for second so that's good enough right i mean it wasn't it was it was a pretty competitive year i mean you look at the yeah. uh the overall records of the teams and that i mean 53 wins leading the league that's that's pretty crazy. Nowadays, yeah. that's like that's like third place in the West. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it seemed competitive, and it was just for me uh, seeing like teams that are in the Western Conference, like uh, seeing the uh, Pacers, Bucks. Now they're <laughs> even the Chicago Bulls and Detroit Pistons. They're all Western. Uh, well, you gotta think teams. as uh, back in the day, you know, they. I mean. They obviously uh, realigned things after the ABA merger, but prior to that, they had 18 teams, right? Yeah. Now we have 30. So the split <laughs> between East and West was a little bit further East at the time. Yeah, <laughs> I, see. I saw that. It was uh, it's insane. And then Houston Rockets, obviously, and the Spurs are all in the East team. So, wow, what a, what a, what a, what a strange uh, thing to look at, right? And Mm-hmm. Some uh, some teams like Buffalo, the Buffalo Braves. I always wondered why Buffalo didn't have a basketball team. Well, well, I... they did have. They had the Clippers for a while, too, and then of course they moved to LA. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, and I, I mean, having the Clippers as your team for a little while probably isn't the biggest bragging point anyway. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it, it is what it is. Uh, I mean, they took the C- Supersonics from Seattle, so. I guess it doesn't really matter how good or or competitive your team is. They're just do what yeah. they want to do. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but that that being said, like I said, very very competitive year. Twenty two teams in the league this year, up from eighteen the year before, merged in four uh, of the remaining ABA teams. The rest went to a dispersal draft and were picked up by the rest of the league. But the really interesting point about that is that for so long the ABA was thought of as this um, ugly stepchild to the NBA. You know, like it was it was this thing that came along a little bit later. It didn't really like basketball pundits didn't like it because it was flashier. It was more ISO focused. They didn't run as many plays as the NBA. It was like the WNBA compared to the NBA today. You know, Mm -hmm. WNBA is a lot more running plays, you know, fundamental basketball and that kind of stuff. That's what the NBA was back in the day was um, it was a lot of that. It was very, you know, in in many ways, your coach was the most important person on the team. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it was. There was uh, there was a real uh, teamwork aspect to the NBA that didn't exist as much in the ABA. A lot of that may have been, of course, due to the lesser talent pool, of course, since most of the best players were in the NBA, with the exceptions, of course. You know, a bunch of them did go over to the ABA. I think four of the all-star team starters uh, in 76-77 came from the ABA the season before. So, like, it's not like they were bad players. It's just the gap between the second best player and the third best player on the team in the ABA was much bigger than the gap between the second best player and the third best player on your team in the NBA, right? So there, there was there was that that went into it as well, but also just the style that they ran. Like, the ABA intended to be flashier, right? Just look at the ball they played with, right? Like, the, this, 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 t- this, this league came in with the idea of, okay, so... Uh, the NCAA has just recently re-allowed dunking. Like, you weren't allowed to dunk in college basketball because Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was too good, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so they took dunking out of there. You know, the ABA introduced the three-point line, right? It gave us the flashy dun- uh, dunk stuff that we get today. It started the dunk contest, right, in their all-star game. You know, a-, a lot of a lot of things that the ABA did really made it more similar to today's NBA than the NBA at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but two very, very different different styles played in the two leagues, thought of as the ugly stepchild because of that by a lot of basketball pundits. They come over to the NBA and prove that that first year, you know, we're just as good. You know, we're, yeah. we're professional basketball players, too. And you see the Sixers getting into the, the finals, but not only did the Sixers get into their, the finals, their three best players were all ABA players. So I, I just want to – so that's – I want to say McGinnis, obviously Dr. J – and uh, I can't think of the third. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's up for it's up for debate which way you go, but I think either way you're you're landing on an ABA guy. Um, but uh, I mean, who would I say is their next best player? Like this is what I mean about the drop off, you know, from yeah. the second best <laughs> player to the third best player. I don't know. I mean, maybe you, you could say Doug Collins, but. When I went, like going back and watching the games and that that they played, I mean, he averaged a quiet 18.3 points per game that season. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I, Doug Collins, I guess, is where you'd go. I mean, you, you could go with uh, with Henry Bibby, Mike Bibby's dad. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. You, you know, you could go to Daryl Dawkins, but he was really young at the time. You know, just coming into the league, also an ABA guy though, Caldwell Jones. Um, you know, world be free. Just getting into it there. His he was 23 at the time. A guy, one of the best names in basketball history. Obviously, <laughs> obviously not his real name, uh, but one. It was like the original Ron Artest. Re- <laughs> renaming, renaming Never. himself. World be free. His original name was actually Lloyd Bernard Free, which, I mean, is still a pretty decent name. Like I. <laughs> Uh, Lloyd Bernard free, but I, it's funny that so many big basketball fans and that have absolutely no idea who World Be Free is. Um, the guy somehow managed to only make one All Star game, but from 1978 to 1970 to sorry 1978 to 1982, the guy averaged 28.8 points per game, 30.2 points per game, 24.1, 22.9, and 23.9. World be free indeed. Right. And and over crazy. and over four assists per game all of those seasons too. And he only got one All Star appearance. That's okay. He made, it, he made an All Star team with uh, with the aforementioned uh, Clippers franchise in San Diego uh, in seventy nine eighty. Don't worry, they were just as bad in San Diego as they have been in L A. <laughs> 
you know, well, San Diego uh, following suit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't need to catch up much on that. They're bad in Buffalo. They're bad in San Diego. And they were bad in L.A. up until, you know, the the, the middle part of this decade. Yeah. That's, that's insane. Those Clippers. It's just uh, one of the things that really stood out to me in this season was uh, I'm probably – I might be jumping all, a little bit ahead to uh, – Spoiler alert for the uh, playoffs, but the Lakers, they won 53 games. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, he won MVP that year uh, with uh, 26 points, 13.3 rebounds, and 3.9 assists. And then they get swept by the eventual champion, Portland Trailblazers. I just can't. <laughs> that's... that's the big thing with that with that Lakers team, I mean, and they won the championship. The oh no, sorry, two years before they won the championship, the Celtics won it the year before. Um, but the thing about that Lakers team that stood out so much is how much it just relied on Kareem, right? Like you you, you go over the rest of their roster and it's all aging players or or guys who ended up being nobodies that kind of stuff right like gail goodrich was there but you know he was in his 10th season in the league right i mean uh you had lucius allen there 28 at the time um just just not much help behind uh behind cream abdul jabbar there of course the great pat riley coming off the bench at the beginning of the season for them um before he got before he missed uh, the remainder of the year there but yeah, like 27.7 points from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar the uh, in the the previous the previous year, right? Comes into um, the following season, like 40 and 42 the previous year. Comes into the following season 53 and 29, um, up from that that year before. Not really any changes to the team, you know. I mean, they lost Goodrich, right? So theoretically, the team got worse, right? But Kareem Abdul-Jabbar just as he did his entire career, just stepped it up on another level. As Dr. J was out dominating in, in Philly, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was quietly doing the same thing, keeping up his his, his decades of excellence over in the NBA down in L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, Kareem, the legend. It is his fifth MVP, too. Like, that's not... <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. This was his fifth MVP at the age of 29, five-time MVP. Uh, I mean... Not enough can be said about this guy, but it, it proves that what stands true today still held true back then is that you can't have a team focused around one guy that's a, cha- a true championship contender. Yeah, no, you're totally right on that, right? Uh, everyone needs a little bit of help. Right, yeah. like it, even <laughs> like even those, uh, you look at like how good LeBron was on like the 07 Cavs, he couldn't do it, right? You need yeah. you need more than just the one guy, and Kareem, Kareem showed that. 65% of the MVP votes that season, which, considering the influx of new players that came in, that's mm. <laughs> that's a pretty decent chunk. I mean, he did have almost 90% back in 70-71, but, like, that was... I mean, the guy who finished second was also on his team, so... <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but yeah, Kareem dominating there. Of course, we saw the Denver team that was dominant from the year before, right? Uh, they're coming into it. That Denver roster, man, that is one of the more underrated rosters uh, in in league history. I, it just you look up and down it, and it's it's hard to point out a weak spot, and it's and it's hard to fathom that they lost uh, to to that Trailblazers team when that Trailblazers team. I mean, it really was the truest example of the team-oriented style of the NBA ball, you know, at the time. Like, when you watch them play, when you watch the final series between them and the Sixers, right, It's it stands out very much how, with the Trailblazers, it's always someone else taking the shot every time, right? Like yeah. It's, it's, it's not different sure. players contributing. You look at the, the Sixers, and it's, it's George McGinnis or it's Dr. J, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hundred for hundred percent on that. Cause the, the one thing I do, I loved realizing is, man, obviously I, I watched the game six finals. Uh, just seeing like they had that one lane constantly open, so someone would just, it was just so like they, the sacrifices on defenses too from Bill Walton. You know, he just oh, focused yeah. more on defense, and he was just insane. He just towered over everyone. 
The ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate what if career, Bill Walton, dude. Uh, <laughs> He he had a shot at being one of the greatest of all. Not saying he isn't one of the greatest of all time as is, but with the four season sample size of, of of him being healthy, it's kind of hard to to put in there. But like his defensive abilities, not only that, but his playmaking from the center position. You know, yeah. like at the time, we we were a little bit more used to it now because we had the dominance of the triangle offense in the nineties. We have, you know, big men now who are who are coming out of Europe that are skilled passers as well. Big men yeah. that played point guard for a lot of their lives until they had their growth spurts in that, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas it, back in the day, it, it was a little bit more rare to see bigs who could pass. You know, Kareem could do it. Wilt could do it. Bill Russell could do it. Um, and it really starts thinning out after that, right? But Bill Walton, when you watch him play those games that season, he was almost the point guard for that team. Yeah, hundred percent, and and just like his offensive presence, it wasn't, and it's not just like the assists and passing too. It's just the offensive boards that he would just get too. Like that, just <laughs> you know, what's better than you know missing? The best scenario in missing is getting an offensive board and getting another chance to score, right? So he's just uh, what what a monster of a player. I was just, I just loved watching him in that finals match. It was like uh, it was a sight to behold. It's, Obviously, uh, Dr. J too, <laughs> but I was enjoying Bill Walton as well. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate, you know, the, to come up with the foot injuries and that. I mean, the dude won MVP in 1978 despite only playing in 58 games. So that shows you how yeah. dominant, you know, he he was in his prime. Uh, demanded to be traded, of course, right after winning that MVP. Uh, played one playoff game the season he won the MVP. So he won. He he won the he got hurt after 58 game after 50 games actually came back played eight games played one game in the uh, in the playoffs got hurt again and was ruled out for not only the rest of that season but the rest of the following season, which he then claimed was due to negligence by the team botching the X-ray that led to his re-injury, um, you know well, claiming uh, claiming the team didn't manage injuries properly throughout the whole time that he was there and so forth and uh, and yeah that, and then his time. With the Trailblazers was done, and he never really, you know, I mean, the injuries throughout the rest of his career just kind of piled up. Yeah, it it didn't let him, it, you know, he he played 80 games again in 85, 86, but he only played 19 minutes a game, you know. Um, it's just a, it's something they had to do, you know, they had to load manage him just to make sure that he uh he could even play just to stay healthy in that, right? 468 games played, and he's a Hall of Famer. Wow, <laughs> that's that's crazy. I guess it's more the what if thing, you know. I guess they're taking account him being injured and for sure. But like you look at his his uh, even over that short period of time, you look at his uh, you know his his resume. We've got he's a Hall of Famer, you know, two time All Star, uh, yeah. rebound champion in seventy six seventy seven, block champ yeah. in seventy six seventy seven, two time NBA champ, two time All NBA, two time All Defensive, Finals MVP. 78 or 77 78 MVP and then 85 86 six man of the year in that uh in that comeback season with the Celtics there. So uh when of course you know they went on to win championship that year with uh with Bill Walton there as well and one of probably one of the greatest teams ever assembled in the history of the NBA. Um so you know even in the short period of time he was able to make a pretty big impact but uh but yeah, it's it's just unfortunate when you have a career that's that great cut that short. Yeah, no, it's like because it you want to see more, right? Uh, no one ever wants to see like what could have been with uh, with Tracy McGrady, right? Uh, Bill Walton, uh, half of the half of the other the late Trailblazers teams in the early two thousands and fifty uh, percent like of that. every player drafted by the Trailblazers, <laughs> right? <laughs> So it's uh, it sucks, right? You, you if you're never know. if you're a college player coming out of uh, out of school and you get drafted by the Blazers, you got to be a little scared, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, because it doesn't seem like things have changed uh, <laughs> with the Trail Blazers in terms of handling injuries, right? So <laughs> when uh, when we were talking the 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 NFL draft and all that, everyone was talking about maybe Joe Burrow saying he didn't want to go to Cincinnati or trying to call his way out of getting traded there, right? I think it's acceptable if you're in the NBA and the Blazers hold the first pick. I mean, maybe maybe stick stick around college for another year. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Like, oh, Blazers might be getting the first. But I think I'm just going to go back to college, you know, just uh, take a little bit of a uh, break, you know, uh, hone unfinished, my skills. Unfinished business, yeah. <laughs> Got to win that all-important college championship. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, and I was like, oh, so Bill Walton's Luke Walton's father as well. So I, I did learn they that look today. almost the same too. It's just, <laughs> like it's impressive actually. Luke Walton's like a slightly more attractive Bill Walton. It's yeah. <laughs> I want I want Luke Walton to grow those like uh, massive sideburns. The sideburns, the big mut- the big mutton chops that, that Bill yeah. Walton was sporting. See, oh, here's the thing though. What? If we if we if Bill Walton had had a better career and we didn't uh, we didn't get deprived of his career because of injuries and that we might never have, never have had the super entertaining Bill Walton announcer we have now that just likes to rip on everybody and has no filter whatsoever. <laughs> that's true, right? So uh, that's always the case, right? Because I hear like, yeah, he's very uh, everyone loves Bill Walton as an announcer. So he is the stereotypical. He, yeah, he is the stereotypical old man. That has no filter. <laughs> and, he, and he broadcasts the NBA. It's like, what, what more can you want? I remember when he used to call finals games. And whenever they'd be in the finals, if they had a good big man on the team, like a power forward or a center that was dominant or whatever, Bill Walton would just spend the whole game ripping on that person. Like, it didn't... <laughs> Like, it was crazy. It was just like, you'd have Carl Malone in the finals against Jordan. He'd, he'd drop like 30 points or something, and Bill Walton is like, well, Carl Malone needs to do more. Like, <laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. And then, and then you'd have it like, uh, yeah, like anytime, anytime he's out there calling game and you have a, a good big man out there, like, uh, uh, I remember hearing him calling like Hakeem's games as well, and it, 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 whenever they'd he'd have like 46 points, and he'd be like, "Well, he's really offsetting that poor outing he he started with here. His uh, he's picked it up in the second half, but they would be more ahead if he would, was better in the first half." It's like what? <laughs> <laughs> Dude's got 46 scored, points. What are you talking did. about? <laughs> like, well, if he scored more points than the enemy team, he definitely would be winning, right? <laughs> it's like that kind of situation. You see, what he uh, needs to do is help his team score more points. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's, he's not elevating his team enough, you know. I think uh, Bill Walton, I'm not gonna lie, uh, that Tailrazor's team was, yeah, like you said, very uh, – used a lot of fundamental basketball, so maybe that's what he's more – I wonder what he had to say about Tim Duncan. I think he's just salty. He's just, oh, that he's just salty that he couldn't stick around longer, and he's like, "I'm better. I was better than this guy." <laughs> Could have been better. It's like, just, uh, just my injuries. Second all-time scoring leader. Poof. I was better than that guy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, uh, who knows? He was. Uh, it's funny career. too. One of the, one of the lines that stood out to me in that finals game was when the I forget. I don't remember for the life of me who was calling the game, but one of the. Uh, one of the broadcasters was like, uh, "Well, if there's uh, if there's any doubts now on whether or not Bill no- Bill Walton can play in this league, there's silence now. He was the first overall pick." Yeah, that's what I was. <laughs> you know, I heard that call too. I was like thinking that I'm like, why did they say that about him? And then I looked him, and that's when I'm like looked up. I'm like, was he like from the ABA and they didn't know if he could play? But I'm like, oh no, he's the number one pick in the league. Yeah. So. Dude. Dude averaged dude averaged 20 points and 16 uh, rebounds per game in college. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, not to mention on 66% shooting. Like, that's that's crazy. Yeah, and on top of that, like he uh, he averaged like 17 rebounds in the finals too. So like, yeah, I don't, who was questioning if he could play or not? Right? Right? Like I don't. <laughs> did was there was there a Bill Walton announcer at the time that was questioning <laughs> Bill Walton? Like some Bill Walton esque guy. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that was that was him. Maybe he, maybe he had haters. I don't know. I don't know the newspapers back then who was like, you know, like how everyone feels about LeBron. You the know, thing, maybe they, maybe he was the thing the about LeBron of the league. Well, the thing about Bill Walton is that we get it skewed now because he's so outspoken and you know he's. He's this big, larger-than-life presence and that when he's on TV and stuff. But playing days, Bill Walton was shy. Like, the guy didn't talk in front of the camera very much. And you hear him do interviews and stuff, and he, you know, there's no sign that he would become what he became. (laughs) 
It's not like Jalen Rose where he was a loud mouth throughout his whole career. It was he. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I did notice that. I'm like, he was very. The way he was playing, he seemed very, uh, yeah, soft spoken. But you know, it's because you're soft spoken. He's also 24 play years play. old, right? Yeah. He's only in his second season in the league at the time. I mean, that MVP that he won was in his third season in the league, and it all kind of just went downhill after that. Fourth season, sorry, in the league. Yeah. And it just kind of all went downhill rapidly after that. Poor Mr. Walton. Uh, what can we do with him? Uh, but yeah, the another thing that uh, I really thought was uh, pretty funny was uh, which which team do you think was more dominant? Do you think the Eastern Conference was the uh, you know how like uh, in the '90s it was the Eastern Conference teams that were the better team, and now it's the Western Conference team? Mm-hmm. Which what would you say would be the better conference in the seven in the decade of the '70s? Uh, throughout the 70s, you probably got to go with the West just because of how dominant the Lakers were in that. I mean, the Celtics were doing pretty good still too, but I, I it, it just, the, the Lakers were throughout the whole decade, they were, they were at the top or near the top. You know, the Warriors were very good. The whole uh, Rick Barry era there, uh, one of the more underrated players in the history of the NBA, by the way, Rick Barry, just a fantastic two guard. That's always, always, always overlooked. A lot of it because of the way he shot free throws, I think. Um, but just because he shot underhanded free throws, we all just thought he was a preschooler. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, I, I I would have to say the West, I guess. You know, the the Nuggets were pretty dominant um, throughout the era. Uh, the Pacers had their moments, you know. Uh, they had ABA moments, you know. Came over to the NBA, weren't as great, but they had their moments throughout the decade. Uh, the Bucks through the early part of it, for sure. You know, when Kareem and uh, and Oscar um, uh, were there. So, yeah, I mean, I got to say the West. Pure, even even if the only reason I'm saying the West is because of the two teams Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he was in the West. That makes more sense, right? So uh, I'm, not, I'm not arguing with you on that. It's uh, just interesting. You know, there's always a weaker conference, you know. Uh and sometimes the finals, the real finals is the Western Conference Finals or the Eastern Conference Finals. And then after that, it's just uh, big But I mean, the, the good thing about this one, though, about these finals is just the lineup of two, like, isometrically opposed teams. Like, <laughs> they were so different in the two styles that you were watching play the game. Yeah. Um, you know, Portland is like extra pass. Let's, you know, everyone touches the ball. Let's try to work the ball around to the inside as much as we can. Where Philly was like, you know, let's get, let's get Dr. J the ball. Let's get George McGinnis the ball and let's stick around kind of the elbow area. And it was two very different styles and two very different games. And it, the other thing, it, it watching it really puts into perspective the way the game has changed too. Yeah. Like some some of the biggest observations just 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 watching that game, or, you know, the two guard and, and the small forward on either team really hung out at basically the elbow, right? Like the NBA yeah. today, they're standing at the three point line, you know, waiting to see what's gonna happen or whatever. If they call a play, they <laughs> might cut, but when they're not in motion, they're usually somewhere around the three point line or running off yeah. a screen, right? This was like they're taking shots from the elbow. They're you know they're rolling around uh, around the the picks up near the elbow, cutting cutting mm-hmm. into the lane lots. It's it's very very different of a style of basketball than what we see today. And obviously one of the biggest differences is the shooting. You know they didn't even have a three point yeah. line yet, right? So it was three years still until they'd get the three point line in the NBA. Although the mm-hmm. ABA did have one, um, but you watch their shots. And it's like, the things that stand out to me the most are, A, how slow their shots are. Like, how slow the ball travels from their hand to the rim. And the shot selection some of the times, too. That's what I kind of noticed, too. And how they're they're off balance all the time, right? Like, they don't don't, don't give a shit if their shot's off balance or not, right? Like, Like, pull up and go, (laughs) Exactly. Like, half of them are leaning forward. Half of them are, like putting as much behind like this tiny like 10 foot jumper as they can like it's really interesting to see how little 
you know, shooting was a part of their their thought process and that, or at least shooting form in that. You look at guys today play, and pretty much NBA player with every NBA player with a few exceptions has pretty close to the same shot motion. You know, they're yeah. very fluid. Maybe they have different release points, stuff like that. But you don't see very many Sean Marions in today's NBA, right? <laughs> like they they have for the most part pretty solid shooting styles that they're taught since they were in you know elementary school right like our gym teachers when we were in school taught us how to shoot a jump shot right yeah these guys probably weren't getting taught that in elementary school gym class and that right so you look at it and pretty much every player had a different jump shot like the way they released the ball the the you know what their legs did while they were in the air like dr j half his shots his legs were like flopping while he was in the air like it was it is is really straight different to see yeah, it was. Uh, you can really tell that the that era, the uh, yeah, no introduction to the three point line. It w- it was kind of weird. I did notice, yeah, like slot selection. Sometimes it'd be like triple teamed, and and I'm like, sorry, but you know, I don't know if uh, a lot of people can take those shots. Like, with times where they could have passed it, they just like, no, I'm pulling it up, and then they would miss. That's all. Uh, back to the finals game. Uh, Portland got that ten point lead because. The because of just the shot selections that they were taking, I was just like, "What is going on? Like, slow it down, slow it down, right? Take the time, take uh, good smart shots." But yeah, not- I would like along those lines, I would argue that realistically, the Sixers were probably the more talented team, but the Trailblazers were the more efficient team. They were better put yeah. together. They had better chemistry. Um, and, and the end of that paid out, you know, winning, winning the yeah. series in six games and winning that game six that, that were, were, uh, that you're talking about. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was a clash. It was a clash of styles and realistically the Sixers. And, and it's funny, you hear Dr. J do interviews later in his career and stuff. And, and he always talks about the fact that it, it, he had to take a while to learn that style of game you know the style that was going to win championships in the nba because he was so used to playing in the aba where it was just we're going to give you the ball and you do your thing right you go to work you get the ball in the hoop do whatever you have to do right (laughs) and then it comes to the nba and it's very different it's you know you need more than just that to uh to win a championship and it took him a little while to figure it out i mean obviously eventually you know he did get the Sixers there, but it took him six or seven years in the NBA to get to the point where he could do a lead a team that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another thing that I noticed in the era was just, it was a little bit more physical. And the three-second mm-hmm. violation, I'm not going to lie, that was so annoying. Just watching. Like, yeah, like they literally, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think you're underselling things when you say a little bit. <laughs> I know <laughs> I, I I am. It was it was very annoying, but just watching, I would they would be in there for like not even that long. I'm like, oh my god, that's three seconds already. Holy, how are you gonna get and generate an offense, <laughs> right? Well, the uh, thing is that it was so much more focused on getting the ball to the paint like that, right? So they're in the paint more often, right? So we don't see the yeah. call as much today. But part of it too is just the. Flat out, the refs aren't as good today as they were back then. Not necessarily that they're not as good, maybe, but as they've changed in the way they call plays, right? The the NBA has done, I think, a very good job compared to most leagues in adapting to the style of play of their league over the years, right? Mm -hmm. So we're a much more offensive-focused game now, and the refs call it as such, right? Mm -hmm. Back in the day... The, the league relied way more on defense. Like, uh, Bob McAdoo won an MVP averaging, like, 12 points per game because he was so good at defense. Bill Russell averaged 18 points per game and beat out Wilt Chamberlain averaging 50 points per game and Oscar Robertson averaging a 30-point triple-double for an MVP because he was better <laughs> at defense, right? So, back in the day, defense was significantly more important than it is today, and that's how they called the game. Yeah, I noticed, yeah, the defense got, got way more calls for them, like uh, uh, charge, or I forgot what, it wasn't really called a charge, I forgot what they, they called it back then, uh, but it was just it was just really interesting in that point, and uh, another thing that I, that I always noticed was just at the very start, uh, literally three seconds to the game, you just see a guy just get slammed to the floor, <laughs> like, like it's nothing, right, it's not even, uh, it wasn't even just a... Uh, it's just setting, setting, setting the tone, man. You gotta set the tone. 
I'm like, oh, this is a finals match. I'm like, oh, we're in the 70s. <laughs> you know? Yeah, how about, how about the Sixers, too? The team of future NBA star fathers, right? Like, <laughs> we had both Henry <laughs> Bibby. And, you know, I knew who Henry Bibby was. I did not realize that Henry Bibby was Mike Bibby's dad. I mean, I mean, I know the name is Bibby, and how many people are named <laughs> Bibby. It's probably a pretty easy connection to make, but... It didn't. It didn't hit me until I looked it up on his basketball reference page, and it said "father of uh, of Mike Bibby." Because I don't know. It just it never struck me that way. But now I know Henry Bibby is indeed Mike Bibby's father. Of course, Joe Jellybean Bryant was on that team too, as we all know, the father of future NBA players Kobe Bryant and Chubby Cox. That's just. <laughs> it was uh yeah and that made a lot of sense it made a lot of sense because uh i think uh he wasn't in the nba too long he kind of went and played into the uh overseas joe bryant you mean yeah yeah, yeah he went bryant. he went over to italy for a while and he was he played in a yeah a lot of european leagues and stuff he bounced around between a bunch of leagues he definitely wasn't the impact player his son was yeah uh, but he was still a, a solid player player you know mike dunleavy was on that team as well by the way mike dunleavy senior who is the father of you guessed it mike dunleavy jr <laughs> wow that's that's crazy that they had all those Heart, players i'm gonna check one thing too because hmm i wonder will this link to it uh gotta check something I can't let this go without checking it. No worries. Um, damn, because I because let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, yeah, it is. Oh my god. Okay, so the seventy six, seventy seven, Philadelphia seventy sixers. All right, had the father of uh of future NBA players, Mike Bibby, um, Mike Dunleavy, um, Kobe Bryant, and Chubby Cox, and WNBA Hall of Famer Tamika Catchings, whose father was Harvey Catchings, and also on that wow. team. <laughs> That's insane. So, uh, I want to check all out... these families uh, had uh, impact players. Yeah, it was this. The, apparently, this was the this was the NBA Finals of of parents because remember, of course, Bill Walton on the other side, father of future NBA player and coach Luke Walton. I wonder if this that has to be a record. What for six fathers of of of, uh, of future, uh, future NBA, NBA players NBA, on the NBA same NBA team? Stars, yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know if anyone's ever tried to track that as a record. <laughs> I <laughs> me either, but now that we see here, we're I'm I'm gonna say it's the record. I mean, yeah, let's just let's uh let's self declare it as as the record. Yeah, we don't have to do our research. We're not. Yeah, working. I mean, no one's no one's gonna look that up anyway, right? <laughs> no, no one really cares. Also, on these two, uh, interestingly enough, on these two rosters that we had in the finals here, a lot of future head coaches in the that, NBA. That's true. You know, we had Lionel Hollins was in there. Bill Walton coached for a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, you go over Joe to Joe Bryant. Yeah, like there, there was the, uh-huh. Mike Dunleavy, obviously, when when yeah. the coach as well. You know, uh, very. Yeah, this is it's like a it's a basketball tutelage year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> coaches and fathers. That's crazy. I hadn't even noticed that that Harvey Catchings was Tamika Catchings' dad too, so that that's what I was looking up, by the way. Yeah, I didn't. I, 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 didn't, did. I assumed it, but I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to say, say it without, it without you for it. sure. Um, other thing that stands out uh, about watching this game, about watching the the '70s games in general, is the conditioning of the players, right? Like you look at Bill Walton, he was a beanpole, right? Yeah. The centers today are like jacked like it, you, you're you not in the nba if you're like there's like two players in the nba that aren't in like excellent condition right like there's like brandon ingram and like zion williamson yeah like, and then all the yeah. enough that will play for new orleans yeah and they're, <laughs> and they're the two the two opposite sides of the spectrum yeah 
But like, like Brandon Ingram is what, like six eight one ninety, like soaking wet, like. Yeah. But uh, but back in the day, that would have been probably the average. Yeah, I think they yeah they were talking about even like the dunk contest. I remember they were saying yeah, the one guy was like six eight, two hundred and fifteen pounds. I was like, oh my goodness, like that's the guy. Uh... So we'll, let's we'll touch on the dunk contest right now because I got a lot to say about that. Um, it, for those of you that don't realize, they held dunk contests in the middle of playoff games, um, throughout that year. They had kind of a bracket tournament, like elimination tournament style thing going on. Um, but, but touching on what you said with the, the, the size, Darnell Hillman, the guy who won, spoilers, spoilers for 1976, 1977, if you intend to go back and, uh, watch the 76, 77, uh, dunk contest. Uh, or or elimination dunk bracket thing, whatever you want to call it. it was um, five minutes, so <laughs> not missing much. Darnell Hillman, <laughs> uh, the guy who won it, who you mentioned at six a two whatever, right? He plays center. Yeah, that's that's insane. Right at the, the bully beaten up. <laughs> it was uh definitely interesting. I, I want to say too, the top prize for that dunk contest. I don't know if you caught it. Fifteen thousand yeah, dollars. Fifteen one five, not fifty, one five. So the winner of the NBA bracket dunk contest throughout the finals won fifteen thousand dollars. That was a lot back then. But what was the what was an NBA player's wage back that back in uh back ah, then? The best players would probably be a couple hundred thousand. Oh, you know, some really sure. good players. I would I I don't know this for sure. But I would stretch to say that Julius Irving is probably the highest paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see what he got. He made... Okay. Ah, damn. They don't have his salary info until 84-85, but it was $1 million in 84-85. Okay. So, yeah, so they yeah, definitely... Keep in, keep in mind, 84-85, also the first Jordan year. So yeah. that's when, uh, and and also you know prime bird magic. So the league was worth much more in 1984-85 than it was in 76-77 when it very well may have been worth the lowest it's ever been. Yeah. Well, oh, sure. the year before probably 75-76. That's just uh, wow. But yeah, back to the dunk contests. Uh, what'd you think of it? It was uh ever <laughs> it was uh it was not interesting. Uh, it was I don't I don't know what the the system was. It was it was really weird how they were doing. I I guess you got an extra what was it 10 points or something if you made all 5 of your dunk attempts. Well, which got, so uh, so they so they kind of focused a bunch on making the dunk attempts instead of yeah, good dunks. <laughs> um the first at least in that game the the final competition or the final round of the contest was Darnell Hillman and Larry McNeil. Um, now, Larry McNeil went <laughs> first. Uh, they, uh, he pretty much just went out there and dunked. Like, yeah, I like to compare it to, dunks. yeah, I like to compare it when, to when you were a kid and you got that first, you know, eight foot basketball net up in your driveway and all your friends could finally dunk for the first time. You held those dunk contests and everyone just did, you know, regular two handed dunks. Like, it, it, cause they just, what else are you going to do when, when you're a kid dunking on a net? And that, that's basically what this looked like. Like the guy was just going up and doing two handed dunks, you know. I think one of his dunks was kind of impressive. It happened on a fast break in a game, but not really during a dunk contest. Like, he did that that reverse where he just didn't even reverse too much, really. He didn't even get to the other side of the rim. He just kind of dunked it on the front of the rim after starting on the left side of the rim, and the crowd went crazy. Like, they absolutely lost it. (laughs) I remember that was when I was like, "Oh wow!" Like, and then I'm looking, sports. I'm looking for the signs afterwards, and I'm like, "I wonder what they're gonna rate things now." Because like none of those dunks, like maybe out of the ten dunks between the two of them total, maybe two of them would have gotten a five in a dunk contest today, right? Yeah. Eight point fives across the board for Darnell Hillman. Eight point fives across, or not Darnell Hillman, sorry, Larry McNeil. McNeil. Larry. Darnell Hillman comes in. His dunks were a little better. Like they like. Yeah, 
I mean, one dunk was maybe a dunk contest dunk, like a first round maybe dunk contest, yeah. or that, that that second round one when you know you're gonna make the first round, but you just need the points from the second round one. It was, yeah. it was like one of those dunks, but the rest of them again were just if you did them on a fast break in a game, sure, but you know, in a contest, not that impressive. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Uh, I liked Hillman's a lot more than McNeil's. So I probably would have given it to him. I didn't see if he did he make that last dunk because it looked like the way yeah, it looked. It looked like he missed it to me. Well, they gave him credit for making all of them. Now that you mention it, I, I don't. I don't. I'd have to go back and look it again if if we're if we're calling conspiracy here. Um, but I. I I do remember thinking something of not knowing whether or not he made it, or or thinking that maybe he missed it. I do remember yeah. thinking that. It looked like he missed it because I don't know. I have to, I didn't re, I didn't add it up, but yeah, I think the way the format was is you get two points for every dunk you make, and then the judge give you style style points, and your maximum score is forty, which is ten across the board. So you make all shots, and you get ten for all style points. Hmm. Yeah, how about that? Did you notice too? The writer on the far left, he gave an eight point five to both of them. Yeah. How do you put both of those on the same scale, <laughs> right? Like no matter That's what way you look at it, and sure, <laughs> neither of them were super impressive, but no matter what way you look at it, Hillman's was more impressive than McNeil's. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And the funniest thing is, I don't know if you you probably caught this at the start, but they booed the first guy and the third guy, but the second guy they just loved because it was a Celtics legend. But uh, <laughs> they, Sam Jones. Yeah, it was it was just it was so funny when the that last guy came in. They just like ooh. Yeah, I know. I noticed that too. <laughs> Just looks down. He just looks so pissed off that he's here after that. <laughs> I remember. I remember the first guy too reacted to it, didn't he? Like yeah, they booed he him, and then he did like a shrug or something. Yeah. Was like, why are you booing me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they booed him. I'm like, what did he do? I, mean, I, I guess that they... writer probably wrote mean things about tra- the Trailblazers and called them phonies or something. I don't know. I think back in the day, they just didn't like reporters. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe. He was the one writing mean things about Bill Walton and saying he couldn't play in the NBA. <laughs> yeah, here's the guy. Here's the guy that's saying Bill Walton wasn't uh, wasn't NBA ready. The first overall pick. <laughs> Must have been him. Oh, but yeah, man. it was uh, it was an interesting dunk contest, that's for sure. I mean, I bet you Aaron Gordon wish he was in that dunk contest. He probably def- I don't know what those people would do if they seen dunk contests. <laughs> They no, honestly, they'd probably just kick the guy out of the league. They'd, they'd be like, "This isn't fair. There's no way. This isn't." I I don't know though, because like Julius Irving was capable of some inc- impressive shit. Like I'd still probably say he's probably the third best dunker of all time. Like I mean, Vince is number one by a mile in my mind. Like I don't. Yeah. Like it's just Vince Carter, and then everyone else comes after that in terms of, of as a dunker. Um, I don't know that I wouldn't put Dr. J second, to be honest. That's interesting. I don't know who I'd put second. I've never. I've I maybe. Been, may, uh, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I've always been uh, Vince Carter's number one in my mind. Just watching it is insane. Um. I have to rewatch Aaron Gordon's and Zach Levine's. I don't know who my number two is. Zach Levine is is it would be up there for me for sure. Yeah. I mean, Zach Levine was hyper athletic pre injury, comes back post injury, and he's still just amazing. So, uh, he'd be up there for me as well. I honestly, I did, I did think about him for number two as well, but I, it depends too if we're talking in game or during a dunk contest because Carter could do it all. Carter could do both. Right. Yeah. Irving was he had some iconic dunk contest dunks, but people just weren't as creative yet in the dunk contest. They didn't have as much to beat. Right. Like nowadays, yeah. you have to do something different every time. Right. Mm-hmm. So which is why I think a guy like LeBron James is never going to compete in a dunk contest, because why embarrass yourself by not being creative enough? Right. Why bother yeah. having to come up with that stuff? Right. Um, Like so, so he, he had some impressive athletic dunks, but, you know, 
realistically a lot of them today you know might might not stand up as well but he was capable of some amazing things and the dunks you saw him do in game were almost more impressive than the dunks you saw him do in a contest right um and vince carter a lot the same way another another like a sleeper i'd put up there too and i'll get off the the dunk contest thing but a sleeper i'd put (laughs) up there too is sean camp oh okay interested because if you go back and watch sean camp highlights yeah he wasn't super flashy but my god it looked like he was trying to take that rim home with him every time he went to the rim. <laughs> yeah, those are, those are the kind of dunks you love. It's just like the, the 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 net just looks violated, you know, just destroyed, just smashing it through. Well, in game, it's the power dunkers that that yeah. fantasize that we we fantasize about the most, right? But in the contests, right, it's the flashy dunkers, right? It's the, yeah. the agile dunkers and stuff like that, with the exception of maybe Dwight Howard, right? Yeah. Uh, other than that, yeah, it's it's more the flashy guys that we see in the dunk contest. But in game, the dunks that look the best because nobody's gonna do like a 360 dunk over somebody in the lane, right? Like, yeah, that's you're, just, you're you're getting it thrown it to the ground if you try that, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, you try that, you're not only getting grabbed and thrown to the ground, <laughs> but like every game you play from there on out, like people are gonna like be hitting you, like yeah. Like you don't. It doesn't you, work. <laughs> you would have to be literally Michael Jordan level to attempt that in a game. Not so much. I'm not talking about skill. I'm talking about respect, right? Yeah. Because like, if Clyde Drexler tried that, d- no, he'd, he they'd cancel him. The NBA would cancel him. <laughs> All of the players would just be like, "No, you're done. We're 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 ignoring yeah, you now." It's over it. Right? Whether he made it or not, right? Just grabbed by the throat and just thrown to the ground. <laughs> Yeah, like, honestly, if you're an <laughs> NBA player and a guy tries something like that on you, I'm just th- throwing him, like... Yeah, <laughs> a flagrant's gonna be called. I'm like, my career weird. is not ending tonight. <laughs> this is not going to be what I'm remembered for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't blame anyone. Right? Like, <laughs> like too embarrassing. Like, nobody wants to be Brandon Knight, all right? Nobody wants to be that guy yeah. that's just known because he gets dunked on all the time, all right? <laughs> It's not even fair for Brandon Knight. I should have I should have went with Sean Bradley because Sean Bradley was at least seven feet tall. Brandon Knight is like five eleven, and it's just like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna brutalize this guy every chance we get. Like, speaking of getting posterized, I remember seeing I forgot who did it, but like Henry Bibby got posterized in that one. <laughs> in one of the, it, it was big, yeah, thankfully I think it was before people would make fun of you and say that you died going in the finals but oh geez i'm trying to remember i have to replay that play but it was just i felt bad for bibby but you know man gotta go back in there watching him play man henry bibby was scrappy but not strong like (laughs) he would he would get in there but he was getting thrown around like (laughs) and that's like you speak today everyone's conditioned today and like Mm. they're just so He's yeah. like he had he had Russell Westbrook's tenacity, but Muggsy Bogues' body. Right? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but you hit the nail right on the head with that one. It's like he played he played like he was Marcus Smart. Like that was the style he played, except, you know, he was also what, six one, one seventy? Like yeah. so it's not it, very big. You could his size was so apparent. Just by looking at like you're like, oh wow, this guy's like way smaller than everyone else. His throw <laughs> game was on point though. Yeah. Like Henry Bibby's. Like that was a solid like foot and a half uh radius throw that he was sporting back then. <laughs> like And like perfectly groomed too. Like I'm pretty sure that thing was like a perfect circle. Like a perfect <laughs> sphere. <laughs> oh man, that was it's insane. Like I don't know how much of that uh, came from hanging out with Julius Irving, but uh, I mean, so you had the best fro of uh, of the finals. Yeah, that'd be tough, right? Like who? You, like are we talking at the, the time? Are we talking at the time? Or say, let's just say best hair, best hair in the finals in this contest. Best hair in the finals. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Best hair uh, at the time, and then we'll say best hair like of all time of the people that were in this game. Right. So like 
or like for example, Dr. J probably has the best hair of all time in the NBA, the most recognizable hair of all time, right? But yeah. it wasn't like 76, 77, it wasn't to that level, right? That it was. Yeah. So I'd say like he's all time, but not current. You know what I mean? Like yeah. current to the time. <laughs> so it's not current at the time, okay. But like you got it, like Bill Walton. Bill Walton also had a classic like cut. Like he was. You know, the Classic mutton chops, the mutton chops, the, the long hair, the poorly placed headband. Like, yeah. Bill Walton was, uh, was, was Tropic Thunder Will Ferrell. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, I might give it to Bill Walton. Or, uh, maybe not McGinnis. Uh, there was another guy that, World be free too. Sporting that one fro. That fro was insane. World be free massive. had some nice hair as well. He was World Be Free, by the way, man, one of the more underrated players. Like he, he, the dude was a thirty point per game scorer, like at one point, yeah. and and he wasn't an All Star that year. He made one All Star game. He averaged twenty five points per game or more, like four times, and like five assists per game more in each of those same seasons. Yeah, kind of makes sense back to what you're saying, right? Though, because everyone valued, uh, oh yeah, defense more. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of big-time scorers at the time that didn't get the, the acclaim that they should have. Like, a guy like George German comes to mind, right? Like, he was... The, I mean, his nickname was the Iceman for a reason, right? Like, he was a lethal oh, that's scorer. that's a dirty nickname. Right? He <laughs> was a lethal scorer. And one of the rare guys that actually got better when he came over to the NBA from the ABA, right? Like, he was good in the ABA, but his ABA averages in four seasons uh, in the ABA, he was at, like, 21 points per game right comes over to the nba for uh 12 seasons or sorry 11 seasons and he's up to 26 right so one of one of the rare guys that actually became better when the aba merged with the nba because most guys it's like the average talent level goes up right so you're not going to be able to do as much right but uh, Gervin or Gervin, he he can't he came alive in the NBA. You know that his stretch from from 77 to 80, three straight seasons, led the league in scoring, 27.2, 29.6, 33.1. Took a year off, then came back and led the league again the next year with 32.3. And up over over fit well over 50 percent all of those years, except the last one he was right at 50 percent shooting. I'm trying to think, I'm still looking. Will world be free? Yeah, and like the, I think Caldwell Jones. Maybe. Gonna, oh, you're still you're still checking for the hair. <laughs> yeah, I'm still looking at the. Hair. <laughs> I think I think I would I think I would give it to Bibby in the moment, like in that in during that series. I'd say Bibby was on point, but overall, it's you know do, do, if we were to make a, a March Madness style bracket for the best hair in NBA history, right? Dr. J is a number one seed. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, there's no question about it. He's a number one seed. He's one of the four number ones. Right? He probably, and as much as it pains me to say it, for the, just, just for the sheer claim of it, you know, Rodman's probably a number one seed too. Yeah. Right? Like, you'd have, I don't know if, I want to say as a sleeper, maybe like Nash as a top seed too. Cause his was sloppy, but it was recognizable, right? Like, that was his yeah. thing, was the hair. Like his, the thing he's most famous for is having to throw the hair out of his eyes before he'd take a shot all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's his. The, I don't know. He should. He had to cut that mug, but like he finally cut it like after a while. Yeah, I think when he went to the Lakers or something, he finally decided. Yeah. He had like he had short hair when he was with Dallas for a while, and then he went to Phoenix, and he was just like, "Nah, let's let it ride." <laughs> yeah. But I, we should do that. We should make a a best hair bracket. Yeah, the NBA no. and do like a <laughs> NBA best hair, best hair bracket. <laughs> that sounds fun. I'm I'm totally for it. Um, back <laughs> back to 1976 though, uh, and the 76 77 uh, season. Of course, we mentioned already Kareem Abdul Jabbar taking home the uh, the MVP award. Just another just fantastic Kareem Abdul Jabbar year. It's just. We're, while we're doing these, where we go back and review these seasons, we're going to get very tired of mentioning Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's name. I know. Uh, 
so uh, getting it out of the way the way early here though. But uh, underrated as well, rookie of the year Adrian Dantley, over 20 points per game as a rookie, a very solid under the radar rookie class coming into the league this year in 76, 77. Not only did you have Adrian Dantley who went on to win a championship with those uh, and be a, a very significant part of those Pistons teams and. Uh, and, and some of the, the Mavs teams and that as well throughout the years. But you had later on in the draft a guy who would, believe it or not, become the 80s, like ac- across the entire decade of the 80s, the 80s scoring, like all time scoring leader with Alex English. Um, and he, yeah, not, not Bird, not Magic, Alex English was the, the 80s scoring leader. And he's in that class as well. Uh, averaging about 14 points per game, just losing out in the MVP race there. So a very underrated rookie class coming out of that year as well. You had Pete Maravich leading the league in, in scoring, who is another name. Just 76, 77, just filled with underrated performances from from players that deserve a better standing. Yeah, it's just... Who knows, man? It's... Uh... I learned I learned a lot more. I'm not gonna lie, my knowledge probably pre '90s basketball is very limited. Uh, I was uh, I was like, oh, who, who cares about the past? You know, that terrible as it sounds, that's how I was. But now I'm a lot more interested because you you have saying who cares about the past isn't the best way to go about things because you got to see where everything kind of comes from you know right uh mm-hmm. where it, and like i said it was interesting to see everybody's different shots uh no introduction of a three-point line and stuff that you would see that would be almost like automatic in today's league wasn't so automatic you know like an open lane lay uh layup that's that's usually automatic nowadays in the nba right and that, then people could still miss it even so i my knowledge is uh very prior but now i'm st- i'm gonna start reading up on all these uh guys and seeing their uh playthrough and thank thankfully youtube has all these old games as well so that's it the does, best part all it. in classic pixelated uh graphics and everything <laughs> it's funny we were talking about it too when when we're talking about these old games and we mentioned a little earlier the point that the nba was at and how it wasn't exactly flourishing or, or prosperous at the time but you mentioned it when you were watching the, the version of uh, of one of the finals games you were watching, Game 6, I think, that you were watching where partway through the fourth quarter, the audio just cuts out. And, <laughs> yeah. And it's because whatever broadcast, like the broadcast that you, we were watching it on, they cut away from the game to show something else, right? So there wasn't audio that accompanied that footage. Like, it, it, it didn't exist because they switched to go watch something else and they'd continue broadcasting it on radio or whatever, right? But it just goes to show that it wasn't, the NBA wasn't the revered league it is today. And yeah. Dr. J coming over had a lot to do with turning it into that, you know? Oh, um, no, 100%. Like, uh, Dr. J is probably the third, maybe, f- He's top five most important in NBA history in terms of building the modern day NBA and keeping it as what it is, right? Like you got one is obviously Jordan, right? Like the NBA isn't the world brand it is today without Jordan, right? Two and three, in some order, you've probably got to say Magic and Bird. Whatever order you put them in, they're kind of inseparable from each other, right? Like I'd put them all together in one because they pretty much yeah. Like, they, yeah, the, yeah Bird, Bird and Magic were the 80s, right? Like, they they put the NBA truly at the front, right? Like, they, they, they brought it so that it was in the conversation with the other sports leagues and that, right? With the NFL, with Major League Baseball and that as a premier sport, right? In the 80s, behind Bird and Magic. But in the 70s, the league was still trying to get a footing. And Julius Irving, you know, he sold out stadiums on his own. In the yeah. ABA, right? Like, the only reason the ABA lasted nine years, nine years, you think, we just watched the NFL, we just watched football this year try to bring out two leagues to compete with the NFL, the AAFL and the XFL, both of them folded. Of course, the XFL has some, you know, an asterisk beside it for the reasoning for folding, and that, you know, you can't predict a, a world pandemic's going to come and close your season, right? Yeah. But we watched both of those two leagues fold under the pressure of the existing league already and just not being able to get there, not being able to, to, to get the money, to earn the money and to match that, that those earnings yet 
the ABA for nine years was able to keep pace, not keep pace, to be fair. They were behind the NBA, right? But they were there, right? Like they were worth noting. And yeah, they were, they were ready to fold in 76, but the NBA wasn't far behind them. The NBA needed the ABA to merge with them just as much as the ABA needed to come over to the NBA, right? Neither of these two leagues were going to survive without the other one. And the NBA wasn't going to survive without Dr. J. Dr. J breathed life support into two sports leagues not franchises not teams not players <laughs> leagues right like dr j was sold to the new york nets from the virginia squires solely because the virginia squires owner recognized that the league that he was part of and that he was making money off of was gonna make more money if dr j was on new york Right, So he gave the best player in the world away for cash considerations so that his league could continue, so that they could keep going. Because 74, they were probably going to fold then too. They send Dr. J over to New York. New York sells out every game because Dr. J's there and everyone wants to see Dr. J in person. Right, The dude was a, was a one-man highlight reel. He was the draw right, uh, of the NBA. He was the basketball player that you wanted to go see, right? And so he sold out stadiums purely on his own, comes over to the NBA and brings them the acclaim they need and that little extra boost they need to make sure they get on TV all the time. And as soon as that happens, it's there's no looking back from there. You know, Bird and, and Magic take over after that. Jordan takes over from them. You know, Shaq takes over from him. And then we have LeBron taking over in there. Like, it's it's amazing to think that without Dr. J... And without the move by the Virginia Squires owner to sell Dr. J, the NBA probably might not even exist today, and it definitely wouldn't exist in the fashion that we know it. Mm-hmm. No, for a hundred percent, it's uh, it's crazy how just little things add up and then impact the future, right? You never, so who knows what uh, then, impact? Next, oh, sorry. No, I, I was just gonna say, and then you got a guy like Pete Maravich who's there in the NBA as well, who. Despite being one of the flashiest players ever to play the game, you know, he was a big draw too, but the the problem with Pete Maravich is while he was a big draw, a lot of people didn't like him for many reasons. One, because he was just, basketball was it for Pete Maravich, right? Like, Pete Maravich didn't give a shit about anything but basketball. The dude died on a basketball court, right? Like, he, <laughs> like he didn't he didn't give a shit about anything in life except for basketball and that was drilled into his head by his dad throughout his whole life his dad was a was a big time college coach right yeah so he coached up pete uh, his whole life and to the point where in college he played for his dad averaged 44 points per game three straight seasons at lsu which are records that'll never be touched never it's impossible it's just not gonna happen right like you talk about records that'll never be beaten people talk about like the um dimaggio's hit streak and, and stuff like that maravich's college scoring record is not getting touched and he did it in three seasons not even four years Three years, because his uh, his JV year back then, you had to play a year of JV before you could play varsity basketball. So you could only play three years of college, right? Your first year was JV, right? So it didn't count towards your overall college stats. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he averaged 44 points per game that year as well. So, <laughs> Jeez. like, he already has, like, a 1,000-point lead over second place. He would have padded that even more if you could count those numbers, right? So Pete Maravich was just this incredible player, but the problem was he, and it it looks, it looks deceiving because he was a good passer and he could pass the ball, but he only passed the ball if he was going to get an assist, right? Like he, he only passed the ball if it was a flashy play, right? That he could make on that play. But one of the best ball handlers in the history of the league, he brought ball handling alive, like Dribbling was pretty basic until Pete Maravich came along, right? And then the things Pete Maravich did with a basketball were insane. But because he was just, you know, I'm the guy all the time, his teams were never very good, right? Like, they they didn't win a lot of games. He didn't make the playoffs until much later in his career. Then the injuries started setting in, and he started missing time in that. But while while he was in his prime, and I mean, one of the numbers that really emphasizes it the most is the NBA didn't track turnovers until 1977, right? So, 1977 was uh, Pete Maravich's second to last, or sorry, third to last year in the league, right? 
So he was 29 years old. He'd already played the bulk of his, or 30 years old, sorry. He'd already played the bulk of his career. His best seasons were behind him, right? So he was starting to tail off a little bit. Still averaged 27 points per game. Uh, but five turnovers per game the first year that they have, that they tracked turnovers, which was an NBA record until like 2006, right? Wow. <laughs> so like you think about if the numbers aren't available because they didn't track them, but you got to think about when he was in his prime and never passing the ball to anybody, just how many turnovers this dude was averaging. Jeez, definitely. Right? I don't think it would have been. <laughs> but I think the, he still might have had the record. Who knows? Right? But he was basically James Harden of his time. He was the first great ball handler, the first great shooter, and that's the thing. You look at those 44-point-per-game uh, uh, NCAA stats, like in college and that, he took a lot of shots that would have been threes today, that were twos then. Right? Yeah. So you look at that 44-point-per-game average, that could well be over 50 if we if you went back and, and tracked all the threes that he was hitting right his last season in the league 1979 1980 was the first season the nba had a three-point line he shot 66 percent wow so yeah and that was the only season he played that they had a three-point line (laughs) so poor guy sometimes the stats still don't come until later right and the dude really did revolutionize, uh, you know, the position of, of, of two guard in the NBA. It really introduced what became the modern day point guard at the end of the day, you know, with uh, the shooting touch, the dribbling ability, you know. The thing is, he was painfully bad on defense. He just didn't care, didn't play defense, right? Wouldn't wow. pass the ball. His teammates hated him. He got forced out of Atlanta because they didn't want to play with him. Um, goes Goes to New Orleans, you know. He's one of the rare guys in NBA history that has his jersey retired for two franchises, right? Like it's he was he was a great player, great scorer, never a winner, so he becomes a footnote in NBA history. Yeah. Unfortunately, died eight years after he left the NBA uh, in 1988 at the age of 40. Had a heart attack on a basketball court while playing a pickup game of basketball uh, from a previously pre uh, undetected heart condition. That's rest in peace, Pete Maravich. This was a wow. dude who lived and breathed basketball, literally through his that entire was... life. <laughs> That's insane. <It's... laughs> Some players are just who knows, right? And, and he... hey, could you imagine if he actually cared about defense or like was more of a good teammate? Oh yeah, if he if he was more willing to pass the ball and maybe play yeah. more of a team game. Could have maybe won some championships in that. Like he could have been, he could have been Jerry West, realistically. Like if, if he just learned how to play the team game better, right? Yeah. He could have been a better version of Jerry West. Still, still to this day, I put uh, Pete Maravich in my top five for ball handlers all time. Right? Like I, I go one Iverson, two Jamal Crawford, three Pete Maravich, right? For me personally, um, and then Kyrie after that. But you know, it's he's. He changed the game, and he doesn't get credit for it, you know. Um, but he led the league in scoring that year, you know. A, a really, overall, a very competitive year in NBA history. One that would lead to was it really opened the door for the rest of for the NBA to become something, right? Yeah. To become the league that it is today. The way the 76, 70, there is there is a timeline where the 76, 77 season doesn't work out as perfectly as it did for the NBA, right? Because you got to think about everything that had to wind up the way it did for the NBA to get the gains it did out of that season, you know? The ABA deciding to merge with them before the season, right? Dr. J coming over and leading the Sixers to the finals, an ABA team to the finals, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, Portland being dominant, Denver still being very, very good. You had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Lakers were still very good. The Celtics were tailing off, getting older, but right at, on the verge of when they would start coming around again, right? Like, it, it, it was it was a great, it was the perfect kind of mixture of ingredients for the NBA to really start to build off of and put together what they ended up putting together. No, 100%. It's, uh, this is a very interesting season, and uh, I'd say probably... Not even top ten, probably top five in terms of important seasons for the league. 
in like terms in terms of importance. Yeah, in terms of importance in building building the uh, the brand for sure, right? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, leading into the '80s when it, it became the the foundation that uh, that what that '80s NBA juggernaut was built on, right? Um, and it has a lot to do with this season. Shout out too, because we haven't mentioned him yet. Real quickly to the the two season wonder that was Don Buse uh, in Indiana, uh, two years, one year in the ABA, one year in the NBA when it moved over. Led both leagues in assists, 8.5 per game and 8.2 per game. Steals, 3.5 and 4.1, which is still a record. 4.1 steals per game in an NBA season. Uh, 8 points, 12 points. <laughs> this guy was the definition of a pure point guard. Yeah. <laughs> which is the reason we have to, of course, close out by mentioning him, because we are the pure point project. And he was a pure point guard. Ooh, I like that. Right? Exactly. So there we go. Bringing it full circle. Closing <laughs> out with Don Buse, who also led the league in three-pointers made in 1981-82, the third season that three-pointers were in the, the NBA. 73 of them that season. Uh, he'd also previously made 72 in the ABA when the, when the three-point line was around there, which led the league that season as well. It's amazing to think that 73 leads the league that year. I know. We had like <laughs> Steph Curry had 400 threes one year, like a, a couple years ago, right? 73 was leading the league that year. It's 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 ridiculous. It's crazy to think about the evolution that the league went through. But we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be coming along here and then marking out that entire evolution with you as we pick it up here week by week, looking looking back in hindsight at these NBA seasons here, starting of course with this one, which was the perfect one to start on because when we when we went about this and decided to do it. We just, we, we thought we'd randomly pick years, right? Um, and randomly, we picked 76, 77, right? Yeah, on the list. It, was, it was great. And it turns out to be probably the best year to pick because it's the first year of the modern NBA, really, right? The first year after the merger and where, where the NBA really comes alive and starts building. So it's a great starting point to go along and, and build on week to week as we go back and look at some of the stuff that went down during these, these NBA seasons. Um, so, that's the 1976-77 NBA season. Portland Trailblazers, your champions. Um, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the MVP. Adrian Dantley, the rookie of the year. The leading scorer, Pete Maravich. A lot of names in the, uh, in this, this season. A lot of big names. Um, you know, David Thompson coming over to the NBA, who is one of my favorite players of all time, as well, over from the ABA. And the ABA itself proving that it could compete on the same level as the NBA, proving that it did, that its players deserved their, their titles among the best in the world as well, especially with those Sixers going on to that NBA Finals and, uh, and almost, almost making something, something, uh, something amazing happen there, uh, akin to the Jets taking home Super Bowl three when the, uh, when the AFL merged with the NFL back in the day and nobody gave the Jets a chance to take home that Super Bowl. Very much, like this season in the NBA, where coming into it, it was like, yeah, but they're ABA teams. You know, they can't play in the NBA, right? The stigma of they don't play the team game. They're not going to be successful in the NBA. And then proving that all wrong and proving that both styles of basketball could be successful. And uh, and it was your choice, which one you wanted to run. A, a real stepping stone for the league and for basketball. So. 